From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars pop culture in the ultimate adventure, life itself. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Knapsack, happy to be here answering those cues. That is right. This is one of our questions of the Everything episodes. And uh, this week, everything is Qui-Gon Jinn in MTV Unplugged. <laughs> the entire history of civilization in those two topics, right? Uh, we should say, as always, that um, we are, not as always, it's special. That's why we're saying it. We yeah. are pre-recording. Uh, I am out of town uh, this weekend as we record at the end of one week, and then we'll be releasing this episode on our on our normal Tuesday. So, you know, if, uh, if the second season of Boba Fett and Kenobi are combined into one season and have been announced, uh, if, if Boba Kenobi has been announced, uh, and <laughs> we don't know about it because we're from the past <laughs> uh, that's amazing i think it's a paul simon lyric right boba kenobi <laughs> rolled out of bed yep so there there's some food somewhere called a boba kenobi and a people boba just, kenobi. Oh, no, i invented a boba kenobi like what you, you want me to eat your fan fiction okay right. i love that I, I challenge our friend dad at the food mud beer to, to create a boba kenobi i don't even know what kind of food it is but i'll give it a try <laughs> Uh, speaking of trying things, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash force center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Uh, this week, we are continuing to recommend Dark Disciple by Christy Golden. Some essential Asajj Ventress storytelling while we wait with our, our fingers steepled for more, more Asajj Ventress. If you want to download your free audiobook today, you can go to audibletrial.com slash force center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audio book. We also have an ask, right, Ken? We do. We are asking for you to consider checking out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Force Center, we have a goal, a quest still ongoing right now. We got close the way Patreon works. You get close, then you two steps back, and then it's it's just the life of uh, us uh, right now. Uh, but if we reach 400 paid supporters, we are going to unlock a new commentary of a Star Wars film. And it could be one we've done before because we're going to put it to you patrons to help us decide. Is it Phantom Menace? Uh, we got the 25th anniversary of May. Is it Last Jedi? We've done that. Uh, we can take a look at anything, but the vote will be done in Patreon. Patreon, and you can help us uh, help us reach that goal if uh, you become a paid supporter and member on patreon.com slash force center also things there exclusive access to the 007 center episode mm. on casino royale and then we have quantum of solace coming later uh early april you know it's scheduling is a thing in life but we're gonna get to it we're excited about that one that's actually the one that kind of launched the idea for you and mm -hmm. i to talk about quantum of solace it's all exclusive there it's also on our shop page if you're not a, a paid member uh get in there and check Check out patreon.com slash force center if you want. Yeah, I had so much fun. I already watched Quantum of Solace and then we uh, had to bump it because we had the pleasure of talking yeah. about Acolyte instead. Uh, yeah. So soon we will get to the, the Quantum of Solace. Uh, first, we needed to enjoy the Quantum of Acolyte. Mm -hmm. um, Ken, did you want to talk life or Star Wars adventures? Uh, the adventures you've had so far or should we make up adventures we've we're going to have had by Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. The way my life works, sometimes I can even predict my adventures. I've just become that predictable in life of just, here's what my weekend will be. But no, you know, here's a quickly discuss just the actual absolute fun and hype of the hack acolyte tra trailer and uh, the discussion around it is always just going to be detractors and, and haters and all those. Sure. Whatever. I, I, I don't feel the need to engage with it right now. I just had a lot of fun taking in uh, the trailer and then doing something I haven't done in a while, which is doing kind of a uh, YouTube tour of not just channels that uh, I know and you know and we've been on or we're friends with, you know, uh, Holy Snokes at PLD Project, Star Wars Explained, uh, the guys at Scoundrels Inc. I was just watching a lot of reaction videos and I don't love reaction content, I will say, mm -hmm. but I, I had just, I got caught up in it too and that's part of the value of reaction uh, videos, I get that. Uh, but it was just kind of fun to have an actual Star Wars hype adventure this past week. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with you. And, and you know, on the live stream, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, the negative uh, reaction that's going to be there. There's mm -hmm. things, there's change that people don't like. Um, yeah. And uh, and there's been some negativity um, around the action figures, uh, sadly. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's announcements of Acolyte action figures. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 
I want, I'm going to focus on the joy because we talked about it. We'll talk about it again, some of the negativity, and you can check out the live yeah. stream. But to stay on the positive, oh, man, I love it when the action figures, if they can't come out for the show, that they're at least announced for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that thrilled me about that Acolyte trailer is just really connecting back to all those years in my life where I'd be like, the height of the Jedi. It wasn't just mm. Luke and, <laughs> and right. Obi-Wan who you know, never even ignited their lightsabers at the same time. And, you know, seeing that lineup of Jedi and you don't know who they are, but you know, they got their own thing, but they're also a Jedi and they look cool. And, you know, the action, I, if I, if I had turned a corner in a target in oh, just yeah. like 1987 before the power of the force, and there was just a new Jedi and mm -hmm. I didn't know who the hell that character was, oh, that would almost been a bonus. It'd be like, great. <laughs> A it's fun amazing. mystery, you know, a, a present to be unwrapped. So I'm excited for uh, the new Jedi characters. I'm excited for the show, and I'm excited uh, to buy them in plastic form. Uh, you, yes, uh, they. I thought they looked really good, and uh, you know, uh, my collecting days aren't done. Some things can pull me back, and there's some 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 figures. I was like, I don't know. I haven't seen the mm -hmm. show, but that might need, need to be on my shelf somewhere. Yeah. Uh, one of the you, you just made me think, unrelated but completely related. You, Luke, Obi Wan, Han holding uh, Luke's blade, uh, Vader. Yeah, we didn't grow up with like three lightsabers on the screen at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did mm -hmm. not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the appeal of the prequels being around that 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 Attack of the Clones trailer shot of all of them encircling lightsabers that and, and even just Anakin and Obi Wan fighting Dooku at the same time three blades on display you're right that spoke to something primal inside me that I needed it, to see it, it it was and like I I can't always be motivated by my sort of uh, uh, genre nerd depression era <laughs> attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, not to make fun of anybody who went through difficult times, but, you know, we all know mm -hmm. people who have like, yeah, no, I, 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 I didn't always have access to money. So I save every penny kind of right. thing. And sometimes I feel that way about pop culture. <laughs> yeah. You know, remember when we didn't have eight Jedi, we didn't know igniting lightsabers <laughs> at the yeah. same time. You'd imagine. I, I'm going to be I'm going to collect that. I'm going to put that in a, in a tin and keep it. Yeah. I agree with you. Well, well yeah. done. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, that wasn't any of my life adventures. That's just Acolyte, I guess. I guess it really is my life adventures of uh, sitting here trying to get work done while scrolling through uh, action figure uh, websites. Oh, yeah. Yep, indeed. All right. Speaking of getting work done, we're going to dive into these questions and spend some time with the Jedi we know and love, Qui-Gon Jinn. This comes to us from patron James Pasqualucci. Uh, James says, hello there, Joseph, Ken, and Jennifer. I will pause in the question to acknowledge that Jennifer isn't here. Uh, Jennifer's got a busy uh, week of life adventures, so she's been having uh, to step away, which is just, uh, you know, we want Jennifer here always, but the way that we make it work is uh, also understanding if, it, if it's a week she can't join us. Uh, yeah. So we all want Jennifer to be here, and uh, she'll be back next week. Uh, continuing, uh, James says, today... I was hoping to hear your thoughts on a moment with Qui-Gon that has always intrigued me. When eating dinner at Anakin's house, Anakin reveals his understanding that Qui-Gon is a Jedi Knight. When trying to deny it, uh, saying he may have killed a Jedi and taken his lightsaber from him, Anakin responds by saying that no one can kill a Jedi. It is in this flash of a second that fascinates me. Qui-Gon mm. gives a young and hopeful boy a simple smile, but then solemnly says that he wishes that were so. That is my personal reading of the scene, says James. I've always wondered what was the source of how Qui-Gon responded. Do you think he is thinking back to the tragedy of Rail Avros's student or some other incident that impacted him greatly as a Padawan that we do not yet know? Uh, or is he thinking of the Jedi as a whole with Anakin's belief representing the total mythical and idealistic side of the Jedi that Qui-Gon has realized they're not currently living up to? Am I just thinking way too much about this scene like any good Star Wars fan would? Can't wait to see uh, what you all have to say. Hope life is going well for you all. Thank you again for the amazing discussions. And may the force be with you. May the force be with you, James. Uh, I, I, based on the number of notes I wrote down, I don't think you're overthinking it, James. Uh, or, or if you are, <laughs> you're certainly not alone. Um, yeah. Ken, I, I want to just start with that beat. Um, back in 1999, even when I had more qualms and grumbles about the prequels than I do now, I like that beat. I like that mm -hmm. beat a lot. Did you... Did you always gravitate toward that moment? Did you always enjoy it? I did. 
I really did. And yeah, same thing. There's some things at that dinner table scene that, you know, would spawn a lot of bar conversations about how bad this was and not, it's for kitties and, you know, talking about Jar Jar and his tongue. Now, I, I like that beat too as well. I but, like that too. Uh, I think I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down, James, as they might say in uh, the uh, the youth. Um, there's a lot there. And what I also think this is celebrating, and, 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 and I'll, you know, we'll dive in deeper here, obviously, is is the 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 now of it all where you're mm -hmm. talking about Rel Avaros that wasn't in our minds obviously 1999. There's so many ways you can take this and so many mm -hmm. ways you can read it, and it speaks to uh, Liam Neeson and his uh, success with the role as well. Yeah, it's it's such a great always in motion is the force kind of uh, idea because mm -hmm. I actually mm -hmm. pulled this question and put together this rundown the day before the Acolyte trailer dropped and we learned that the central mystery mm. of the Acolyte is somebody's killing Jedi. <laughs> right. So, you know, it becomes, uh, you know, right. hey, Qui-Gon could be thinking about back a hundred years ago when there was a Jedi serial killer. <laughs> like, yeah, they, they really can die. Uh, it, it, it's a problem. Um, yeah, I think it, it, I've always loved it because I think it's just such a it's such a character moment. It's such a great sort of a show don't tell character moment for Qui Gon of uh, showing a, that a real still waters run deep that he's got a lot on his mind and he's he's lived a life and he is it's it is it's really wistful. It's really sad. The yeah, yeah. I wish I wish that were true, but it really isn't, <laughs> kid. Yeah. Um, it is beautiful. I want to dive into some of uh, uh, James's theories because I agree with them but i also just want to you know to take a step back and say you know why that beat is there back in 1999 like it, it's fun for us to dive deep and it's fun for us to connect modern canon but um back in 1999 i think that beat served a lot of purposes uh mm -hmm. for the story of the phantom menace i think it it shows that the larger universe even in out of the way place like tatooine are aware of jedi but their understanding of them is very mythical as James mm -hmm. is saying, um, mm -hmm. I, I think it also shows us a lot about Anakin. It shows us his um, early fascination with what would be one of his downfalls with being all powerful. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that there is something in this galaxy that is all powerful and unkillable. And mm -hmm. I want to be something that has so much power. It, it can't die. Um, I think it's also there in 99 for the uh, the irony that Anakin himself will find out, yes, you can't kill Jedi by doing it, by doing mm -hmm. a lot of it. Um, yeah. I think that line also has like you know strong relationship to the teaser poster of Anakin with the, the Vader shadow. Um, so I think there's a lot there from Anakin's perspective back in 1999, and I also think there's a lot there from Qui-Gon's uh, perspective Uh that like James is saying that, you know, he, his perspective is not so much that the Jedi are, I don't think he's wistful because the Jedi are flawed. I think it's just a, a reality to him that Jedi aren't all powerful gods. And that's mm -hmm. in fact, why it's a big choice for Anakin to come with because mm -hmm. it's a responsibility from powerful, but mortal <laughs> uh, beings. And, there are prices to be paid, like death. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is uh, exactly where I kind of went to on some of the stuff. I wrote down the idea of it's 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 just very clearly an early lesson with Anakin and letting go. Uh, I love how you <laughs> framed it of the power. Uh, bring in the novelization, Terry Brooks novelization. I mean, it, it begins with Anakin having dreams. I mean, not even be all through the book. Anakin has dreams, dreams of using his power for good, for saving, for freedom, for all these things, and and having it tied into that. I love what you're saying about the the myth of the Jedi at this point, who are alive and well, but you know they're in the central system. They're they're in the big city. This isn't uh -huh. the big city. This is a different view of it. Uh, and and I wonder how much. I, I agree with you that it's not uh, super heavy on, on Qui Gon's mind, like. <sighs> I have to, I, you, they can die, and I've been telling the Jedi Order this for a while. Like, mm -hmm. but it's it's it definitely would would affect his perspective on it and his sort of 
galaxy view on on the Jedi at this point. Of I don't know, maybe even we're, we're buying into that myth. Yeah, there's some folks I work with that they think that's true too. Um, mm-hmm. Is that completely front and center in his mind at that time? No. Uh, and again, the re- rally, Liam Neeson doing what a great actor does. He's probably got that story in his mind that has nothing to do with canon. <laughs> he's probably mm-hmm. picturing Tim Roth as his Jedi buddy who died, and he's like, he got a story. <laughs> but he's playing that beat. He's playing the moment so well, right? <laughs> I'm thinking of Rob Roy during there. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it has. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a that's a hell of a thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's it's a thing. Um, I remember someone handed me that movie to watch on VHS. I watched. It, I was like, what? If, oh, history's brutal um but you know what i mean like like so yeah there's a lot to pull out but it all does track for what's going on in the story this is why i like uh, george and his moments uh uh you can you can pull apart a lot of other things you don't like including the dialogue and maybe some of the the stiffer performances that might have been because of his uh, approach or directing whatever you can have those conversations and go in circles all day i just love pulling apart moments moments like this and what it means for anakin at, at this moment in his life yeah i mean I think also a back in 1999 thing that, you know, when we go deep, sometimes I also like to remember to stay a little bit on the surface. It's also great foreshadowing that Qui-Gon himself is going to die. Oh, yeah. If if we were doing an Easter egg video, we'd put the red arrow to uh, this means he is of its foreshadow. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Or we're not really foreshadowing if you've already got the infamous soundtrack that uh, spoiled (laughs) Qui-Gon's noble land. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that was the moment in the theater we all went, oh, it's true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, you know, we're we're going deep, but I also I think I for me, it's kind of fun to just sort of unpack. Like I always I always liked that beat. You know, because I just I felt it kind of humanized Qui Gon and still waters run deep. And uh, Mm -hmm. I think a great sort of moment of, you know, he he kind of appreciates this hopeful, childish, optimistic perspective, but but it's not true. You know, Mm -hmm, (laughs) I feel like when mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when somebody, you know, tells you, like, yeah, I think uh, I think climate crisis will be gone in two years as a like a 14 year old, and you're like, I I hope so. You know, I, I, it yeah. always had that sort of human element of it. But I think the more that I think about it, I think um, I really resonate with what James is saying is that Qui-Gon is, I, I think he's he's not just kind of going through the motions. He's got the nature of the Jedi on his mind. You know, we're getting yeah. some great modern storytelling about uh, that book's going to come out where Qui-Gon challenges mm-hmm. the Jedi Council to... Mm-hmm get out of their, you know, uh, uh, almost literally ivory tower, get out of their mm-hmm. big tower and uh, mm-hmm. go see the rest of the galaxy. Um, yep. So I think he, I think he's got his head, you know, really screwed on his shoulders and is thinking about the idea of it's a, mm-hmm. it's, it's a, such a responsibility to be a Jedi. You walk away from a lot of things that other people have you uh, it, it is, entirely a life of service it's a challenging life right now where he's upset that the jedi aren't doing things the way they want to and you know Mm. it it is it is not a it's a heavy burden it's a heavy responsibility and you might give your life in the line of of duty and i think a lot i i see that contrast from you know uh uh, the way anakin is fantasizing them about mythical beings to no it's a it's a job and it's a really hard one dude yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah that ain't it you in fair he's got he's got his mind on the order and the order on his mind it's yeah. it's all <laughs> yeah. uh going through there and I, you know I, I i also appreciate what you're saying about hey you know we also want to just play with on the surface of what the scene means and what it's hinting at in the movie and in the context of 1999 but this is also why i have so much fun with the prequels in particular where i think there's so many things you can pull out of them and even if they're not 100 percent there or 100 percent intended like i don't envision in my head again the george lucas and rick mccallum were chewing gum on the set and they were like liam uh, there's this is what's going to play liam did his job of putting that story in. not unlike alec guinness we always you and i always talk about the tip of the iceberg story of of the pauses in alec guinness talking to luke skywalker mm-hmm. uh nine movies uh, an entire series. Uh, that's just what's fun. But I, I, this is when people ask me that, and, and, and friends with good intentions, like I, I don't, I just don't get what even now you see in the prequels. I can appreciate them more. I understand there's some layers. I love this. I love wondering what Qui Gon is thinking at this point in time, based on the additional story 
telling we have and wondering what it means for Anakin. Uh, again, love what you're saying about, yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to be powerful. <laughs> that yeah. sounds good. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm, we are, you know, I think infusing it with lots of context from the larger storytelling. But mm-hmm. also, mm-hmm. I think it is just a good, well-played beat and, and you don't have to go... I mean, th- to me, that this it's the point of uh, little moments like this, of uh, those little human moments that tell us, that are tip of the iceberg, that tell us so much about the way the uh, character mm-hmm. is. Uh, mm-hmm. And the fact that he sees this thing that even we, we the audience, are going to the theater to see mm-hmm. a fantastic, you know, wizard with a laser sword have adventures. And mm-hmm. even Qui-Gon's like... <sighs> It ain't all that cute. <laughs> you know? You know what I, yeah. You know what I love about that? Again, yes. I, I Going deep to maybe le- levels that, that are that are only there if you want to engage with it. But that's kind of us as an audience, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's not a, To me, it's not unlike Luke going, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become a great warrior. And Yoda being like, oh, let me tell you about that. Yeah. <laughs> of us sitting in the theater in 1999 going, this is a story of the Jedi at their prime and their, their heroes. And I would say that they are and they're indestructible. And we know that's not true, but you want to believe it. And it's almost Qui Gon going, yeah, no, this ain't that story. <laughs> this, this ain't it. Yeah. It's that much ain't more it. real than that. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a responsibility. And, and I think it ties to the, when he really tells Anakin, it's like, it's a difficult path. It's your choice. But, you know, mm. you're, you're not just going to, you know, level up. <laughs> real quick and become all powerful yeah. and unkillable. This is a difficult life full of sacrifice. Is that what mm-hmm. you really want? You know? Yeah. Um, so to, to take it back to just uh, having the fun of looking at the, that beat uh, as a part of a tapestry and, you know, mm. uh, yes, in 1999, George Lucas did not know Claudia Gray was going to write, you know, a novel, including the character yeah. Real Avros. Get it. But we can look at art in lots of different contexts and it's fun to look at it as just the text. And now mm-hmm. all these other pieces of text exist that could be speaking to it. Do you have head canon of what, what you think Qui-Gon is talking about or what you would like him to be reflecting on when he has that moment of sadness? Some of the, the Avros stuff works for me here. Uh, I don't remember all the details of the story uh, other than Raoul Avros's, Avros's uh, um, uh, accent uh, in the uh, audiobook, But uh, I, I think just a lot of the history. Hey, insert what you want, High Republic. Insert the events we're going to learn in the Acolyte, whatever it may be. But uh, a lot of other Jedi along the way that didn't fall or didn't become dark side users or didn't become one of the Lost 20. You know, maybe he's got some Dooku thoughts as well. But ones that, you know, I don't know, just got killed on a planet trying to solve a problem, trying mm-hmm. to do their job. Uh, I, I, I think that's that could be part of it as well for me, that that is just not true. Uh, any way you slice it, kid, I wish it were. Yeah, I haven't, you know, reread um, Master and Apprentice with the Rail Avros story, but it, it's mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. Rail kind of goes into that depression and kind of hide, hides out on that long term job. Yeah, uh, because he lost his apprentice and has this sort of I, I failed them. So maybe he is thinking about like, yep, even, you know, mm. Padawans die because Jedi are, are so not all powerful. We sometimes can't even protect our own. Padawan, um, and then you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, people go into decades long depressions about it, you know, like so. Yeah, no, uh, we're uh, we're real killable, <laughs> real killable. Um, or I mean, it'd be great if he has been just like, Yeah, where did the Jedi go wrong? Well, about a hundred years ago during that, yeah, serial killing <laughs> Jedi spree, and maybe that's really on his mind, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to take it there, but I—that's all. Yeah, that's, this is a lot, a lot of from Qui Gon's perspective. But I, uh, again, love what you're saying about um, just uh, the Jedi and what people viewed them as, you know, mm-hmm. and how they, they you know, clearly were known, but even this far out, uh, I saw your laser sword. I, you know, mm-hmm. so the kid, the nine-year-old kid uh, living this, uh, you know, lowly existence of Tatooine has heard the stories, but they're just stories. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, I think final thought for me too is I think it is a perspective that uh, that. Uh, get, gets expanded upon in lots of other places that I think, you know, Qui-Gon's the kind of guy of like, well, we should die. Not that we should be murdered, <laughs> but yeah. just that death is natural. And that, yeah. that sort of longing to be something that can't be killed or can't die is not for Qui-Gon. It's, you know, you're here for a while and then you pass into the cosmic force and that's, yeah. you know, that's his thing. 
Yeah, and, and look who first learns how to call back mm-hmm. <laughs> from the other side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with you as far as final thoughts. I really love it as a lesson for, for Anakin. It's an insight to what he thinks. Uh, it's an insight uh, what he would love to be, even with the best of intentions. But also, again, first first kind of lesson of letting go. Mm-hmm. Uh, that ain't true for any of us, kid. But yeah, we're not more that now. More tragedy of only uh, if only Qui Gon had not had a noble end, and indeed yeah. could have trained. <laughs> Uh, Well, great question, James. We're going to take a quick break, and then we are going to summon all of our Qui-Gon wisdom to talk about MTV Unplugged. Back in a moment. And we are back to continue our discussion. Cues of the everything. We had so much fun uh, during the strike when we were not able to talk about Star Wars, talking about all sorts of other things. And, And one of the main things that popped up a lot is music. Uh, and this is what our patron Anthony King is asking about. Uh, he says, Hey, Joseph Gannon, Jennifer, periodically while scrolling on YouTube, I will often find myself watching clips from the MTV Unplugged sessions, most notably Alice in Chains' epic performance in 1996. With the music conversations on Other Center, I was curious about your thoughts regarding these performances. Do you like them, love them, hate them? <laughs> Were they big event viewings upon premiering? It seemed like everyone in the 90s was doing these types of specials from the legendary performances of Nirvana to even Kiss Unplugged, seeing the original lineup reunite. Mm -hmm. Why do you Mm -hmm. think they were so popular? Additionally, what modern artist or artist that hasn't released an Unplugged album previously would you like to see undertake an acoustic performance? Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Mm. Yeah, so this is uh, I I have a relationship with a couple of specific episodes Mm -hmm. of MTV Unplugged. Uh, mm-hmm. It never really stopped to reflect why it was so popular at the time, but I got thoughts. But Ken, mm-hmm. you are you have become an MTV unplugged uh, uh, Wikipedia entry, right? You you <laughs> yes. You you tell me off air that you've looked up the details. You know the facts. Yeah, this is by a strange coincidence, Anthony. Unless I I don't know, uh, did I slip any any of this out anywhere else? Is is Anthony uh, pulling from something? Recently, uh, and I'm too, you and I um, were in the same era, and that mid '90s explosion of these type of shows, the uh, MTV Unplugged, which also kind of led to VH1 Storytellers, and uh, then you have uh, VH1 Legends and the, you have the 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 Rock Docs that were kind of exploding. And God, I love those things. That Fleetwood Mac Rock Doc <laughs> they did on VH1 behind the music, the Mamas and the Papas one. I always thought it was a movie. It was so crazy, and even more crazy stuff later on as we learned, unfortunately, about some of them. Um, so I love these things. And and you're right. There's those mid-90s ones. But this came up, me and our buddy, we mention them all the time here. We love our buddy Ken Plume over at Force 5 and Open Chat and bit of a chat. And uh, he and I one night were playing the Fortnite and this came up. And we ended up, while we we're playing the game, we're both looking up Wikipedia stuff. And this goes back to 1989. I didn't even really realize that. It explodes in 96, but it begins with Squeeze Sid Straw, one of my favorite artists, and Elliot Easton. In October of 1989, and it explodes. 1989. 1989, man. On MTV. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And a lot of great bands. There's a great story of Joe Walsh and Dr. John, and Joe Walsh wanted to do some Eagle songs, and Don Henley said, absolutely not, and faxed like a two-page letter and said, unless I'm there, uh, they didn't want that. So they went literally next door to where Dr. John was appearing on a VH1 morning show and said, can you come play with Joe? Oh, also, by the way, Joe is hammered, and this is one of the incidents that started to get Joe Walsh sober. So Mm. uh, fascinating history there, too. Um, But I do think there's some thoughts of why it picks up and explodes in the mid-'90s. You? Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, yeah. I want yeah. Let's talk about the um about why we think it was popular, and then we can maybe get into some of our personal experience because I'm very curious what mm-hmm. your relationship to it was at the time. You know, I, I, thinking back, I, I think it was a couple of context things. You know, it, MTV was so known for faster, louder, bigger, wilder. Like you can mm-hmm. Google and find in the '80s and '90s lots of critics complaining about television shows and movies using that fast MTV video editing and the speed at which they cut everything and the volume everything has to be at is this, you know, thing that is going to derail all of culture. And now when we watch older, older things like scenes done, are you going to (laughs) cut? Like, yeah, no, (laughs) yeah, yeah. everything is MTV. So I think there is that just kind of natural evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, But from my perspective and in, my you know 
experience, you know, I was surrounded by people who liked heavy metal, uh, mostly heavy metal or kind of rap early hip hop. And like all of it was sort of like, how much more intense you can you be in whatever you're doing? You know, can the yeah. guitar solo be louder or faster? Can the, the bass hit even harder? Um, all that can, can the attitude be even edgier? Uh, so I think there's that big, 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 more, 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 faster, faster, faster. I think mm -hmm. also, you know, the, the I don't remember exactly what year the Millie Vanilli lip sync scandal was, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of talk about that of, of, Every, everything in pop has become fake and plastic. It's all a show. It is one of the reasons that Guns N' Roses were popular is because a lot of people had a sort of um, posture of like, we're dangerous. And like, no, no, no. They they show up late and sometimes jump into the crowd and punch people. And, and that song about a yeah. coma is because he overdosed. It's real. They're real. Uh, so I, I think the combination of a desire to prove authenticity, a desire to prove mm -hmm. raw musical talent, combined with the, we don't need fast cuts. We mm -hmm. don't need it to be louder. We can sit down with a guitar, muted drums, and it's just us, nothing else. Everything stripped back and we'll show you the chops we got. I, to me, I think that's some of where they like, Oh wow! No fast cuts, no stadium, you know, n no way they could be faking that. No backing yeah. vocals. It's intimate and real. I think that was the pendulum swing that made it so popular by the late nineties. Yeah, yeah, and you're just talking about the Winger and Slaughter one from 1991. That's what you're <laughs> mentioning here. Yeah, no, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Especially uh, the the explosion of of of. Uh, Different music genres taken over in the in the nineties. I think one of the ones that that, that explodes or I keep using the word explode. I'm, feel, I'm I feel like a v, VJ today, but it's the Nirvana one, right? And that comes in ninety three, and, and it's a timeless one as well. That even someone like me who didn't grow up a, a huge Nirvana fan always would play it on on my radio station back then when I worked there. Or always listen to it because it and that it it kind of did what you're talking about. Where I was like, well, I don't, I don't know, I don't like grunge and the hair and the mumbles and the, I don't know, I don't know about this. Like, and then it was like, oh crap, no, no. At the heart of this is is not a they're not they're not a genre. They're 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 bad. And, uh, and uh, you can see it clearly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Kiss, for what it's worth, better or worse. I've played Kiss mini golf. I'm part of the problem. Um, but them in '95, it was part of the comeback. Yeah, you, you, you know, uh, 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 it was uh, Eric, Bruce Kulick and uh, I think what Eric Carr, or Eric Singer, were on the way out. Someone will, I'm sure, correct me. But uh, then have Ace and Peter come back, and this is it. But you know, they're they're. They're not in the makeup. They're not in the, the boots. They, mm. they are a band. And that's still my favorite Kiss album is Kiss Unplugged. It's mm -hmm. a, it's fun. And yeah, so I think you're right. It it, it was uh, it was uh, not nostalgia, but it was like, a, 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 yeah, let's get back to the simpler times and just peel it all back and show show you who these artists are. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Tony Bennett, we'll show you who Tony Bennett is, which they did in 1994. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, with Nirvana, there's a sort of extra level of authenticity. Like I, I'm not a Kurt Cobain expert. I haven't read a, a million uh, biographies, but I've had multiple mm -hmm. conversations with people who, uh, you know, have talked about how he, yeah. one of the things that, you know, tormented him is, is this idea of authenticity of, yeah. you know, am I, you know, do people believe I am, am who I feel like I am kind mm. of thing. Uh, mm. I think a lot of bands back then would always talk about being based in the blues, but to just have him wail yeah. a tormented blues song yeah. is really authenticity right it's like i'm mm -hmm. trying to communicate <laughs> well, yeah. uh, some some true torture in the old soul here yeah 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 and and, and it allowed him and, and obviously uh you know a lot of tragedy just around him and his mm -hmm. in his life i get it uh um we were there man but like i there was a great story of butch vig of uh who produced uh you know never mind all that stuff and drummer of, of garbage of saying you know often uh, uh cobain would be in the studio just writing beautiful acoustic songs, playing them to the self, and I would try to secretly record them 
and he would demand that I destroy them because it, it and, and for whatever reason it was too intimate right. it was too he shared too much of himself it, I don't feel it was a oh that's not my image or the brand it just was he was uncomfortable with it. so I think unplugged allowed a little of that to come out in a way at the at, at 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 the height of their powers so to speak that you were able to see a lot of that expo- explode and I think that for a lot of those bands Alice in Chains another example mm-hmm. uh, and that's why why Anthony brought it up you know it was powerful for that kind of stuff. The ones yeah. that really transcended just the program to become a, a pop culture, a zeitgeist conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any other uh, thoughts about why it reached that, the level of popularity when it did? Uh, a lot of it with the time, too. I don't know. I mean, you you were – it's not just an age thing. You know, when, yes, you know, there, you can um, you can measure how old you're getting, not just of when you don't know the new bands, but when you stop watching – a lot of those shows, whether you watch them all the time or not, but like MTV and Total Request Live, Real World, like those, even when I started to get older, those are still part of my existence. Mm-hmm. You were still very aware of it. And I think there was just this wonderful explosion and this, uh, uh, God, why am I using that word today? I'm just feeling like a rock journalist. I'm feeling like Kurt Loder in the in the 90s. Um, but it just was everywhere. So you wanted to soak it all in. Uh, I, maybe I'm speaking through the lens of someone who was, you know, in radio, rock radio at the time, it just seemed everywhere. <laughs> 96 was a big year for music and one of the last final years of rock as we knew it, some will say. There, 94, the explosion of grunge, all this stuff. God, damn, it just was so fun to just be part of it and 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 see it happening, not part of it like I was playing in these bands, but just like being around for that stuff that you just wanted to soak it all up. And, and the VH1 Storyteller series is amazing too. This, the, one of the early ones I fell in love with was Elvis Costello just explaining stories behind Allison and all that kind of stuff. God, it was, it was just great. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe has, has some of it does have to do with that shifting time. I mean, uh, I am a big Nirvana fan. I was then I get like I'd not, you know, like I said, I haven't read a million uh, biographies, mm-hmm. but I had all their albums. Dave Grohl was my favorite drummer when I was playing the drums. And I listened mm-hmm. to those albums again and again to learn, try to learn his drum parts. Yeah. Um, it, played smells like teen spirit in our high school lunchroom and started a food fight which is just you know one of the coolest things that ever happened to me that's uh, a music video <laughs> that's a music it video is right yeah there. when the chocolate milk exploded on my ride tom <laughs> so cool um <laughs> yeah but i think that uh we have talked a lot uh especially in other center about uh the 80s being a, a grim time with the concern of nuclear war and aids and satanic panic and and all these things Mm. i remember everybody like not everybody uh, i remember people some people feeling and talking about that shift from heavy metal that was sort of like edgy except for you know edgy and i'm gonna party all night i'm gonna do whatever i want except for that here's the one song uh, a (laughs) <laughs> that's a ballad about a, a different girl's name every time uh, this one uh, my ballad's about christina uh, yours is about becky cool i don't know God, it's God. all hard all the time mm-hmm. one ballad about loving a girl and then all hard all the time right and then uh, now i'm the one that wants to be with you let's do it let's sing it. Uh, only on this track not on the other 11 tracks not on the other one. ones yeah um <laughs> But Nirvana had this energy, and a lot of grunge had an energy of the changing times of, yeah, the nightmare of the '80s is ending, and unlike many of us were led to believe, we actually are going to have a future. The Cold mm. War is over. There are possibilities, and to have like a, a group like Nirvana that uh, was sort of just as hard rocking. Mm. but didn't have as much of that chip on their shoulder and look like they were looking toward the future, mm. you know, and didn't mm. have as, you know, uh, frankly, sometimes misogynistic lyrics, you know, right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. I think that was a big shift in the time too. And maybe that kind of went with like, you know what? The eighties are over. And what are the nineties going to be about? Unplugged. <laughs> Unplugged. Unplugged. Yeah. Yeah. So which uh which episodes of MTV Unplugged were appointment viewing? Which ones did you catch? Which ones meant a lot to you? Uh, no, I didn't w- watch Nirvana yet. I was still in high school, and uh, I caught up with that one later. We used to always play the, that those tracks on our radio station too. Uh, Kiss, I was front and center for watching the the, the moment it uh, showed up. Uh, there's a classic one with Oasis where uh, Liam got drunk and sick and couldn't perform. 
and Noel sang, but then Liam was in the balcony yelling at him. It was it's a stunning study of the band at the time. I uh, love that one there. Uh, you mentioned the Tony Bennett one. That, that's fascinating too. Of of you know in in this alt rock grunge era, that was kind of where I first. You know, heard of that? I knew the name. Maybe had seen it. I don't know. Passed him, him in a record store, but here he's doing Unplugged. That was fascinating for me mm-hmm. uh, to to have him um, kind of uh, uh, you know learn a lot about him there. But yeah, the, the, but yeah, there's a who's who of every band for that time. But those are the big ones. Uh, I remember I liked the Chris Isaac one a lot too. Oh, uh, I didn't yeah. even know that, and I loved uh, Chris Isaac because he had he had uh, mm-hmm. his Wicked Game song uh, was yeah, in yeah. David Lynch's Wild at Heart. Absolutely, um, and that song is yeah intense. And the Eagles uh, did their Hell Freezes Over one, uh, kind of in conjunction with it. That one there too. It's a lot of that kind of stuff. Awesome, uh, but it's fa- you- this. I mean, I'm getting lost in the list because then you just like you, you're like, what? When that happened? <laughs> uh, did you watch MTV at home or because uh, because yeah. we we've, we've in th- that was allowed that was not a well but, you know it wasn't allowed growing up and you know up until the you know nineties yeah as I was in high school I think my mom n- knew they were losing some control mm-hmm. <laughs> for me but I would still sneak home to you know hope that uh, Prince's Cream video was on and I could watch it before they got home but no by the time I was working on radio and everything it was it was always on I mean uh, yeah. I always thought I wanted to try out for Real World and didn't and uh, i you know lo- i i love the early incarnations of of total request live i thought uh, mm-hmm. carson daly was good i i the whole cast of the time i thought dave holmes was a great addition to stuff i love kurt loader's a great influence on just stuff i would do later on in radio and even in schmoes and stuff with the news yeah mm-hmm. it, it was it was always a, a, a part of my uh, day yeah yeah, no, I would I, I would uh, come home and uh, it, it was great when uh, nobody else was home because I would just sit there and watch MTV for, for hours. Um, yeah, so f- for me, the big ones were Nirvana. Like I said, the the band was uh, big to me then. I was really curious to see like Dave Grohl like to hit them drums hard. Uh, so I found out about the existence of those uh, uh, bundle sticks, <laughs> which you know it are you know don't produce as much volume. Um, mm-hmm. And it was uh, so cool to hear them do other songs that weren't just uh, theirs, um, you know, and really try to use that platform to introduce people to the music that had influenced them. Uh, the Meat Puppets mm-hmm. Lake of Fire is the one of my, uh, the, from MTV Unplugged is one of my, yeah. their cover of it is one of my, favorite songs uh the puppets are great and i you know it was uh i know a lady came from duluth uh you know in 93 i was still like someone mentioned something from the state of minnesota amazing (laughs) uh but i've used lake of fire as the like closing kicker for a a couple of the different stage plays i've written uh Mm. so that i sat down and watched that one that one is close to my heart Uh, i've listened to it a million times um And then the other big one for me was Tony Bennett. That was uh, appointment Mm. uh, viewing because I had just got into uh, Sinatra in like 93, 94. Uh, There was the kind of rumblings of the uh, weird uh, swing renaissance that happened in the mid to late 90s, uh, uh, culminating really, I think, in in the movie Swingers. (laughs) Movie Swingers might have fueled it and also ended it at the same time. I think I think it maybe did both. Um, Yeah. But it, yeah, for yep. anybody who doesn't know, Tony Bennett, you know, a little younger than, you know, Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, Sinatra had said many, many times that Tony Bennett was his favorite uh, other saloon singer, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and Tony Bennett is just a fascinating, fascinating guy who uh, sings the standards, has like a cup, I think one main album where he got talked into like, do modern music and it's a real groovy cover where he's got like a big orange artsy uh bell bottom illustration and he's singing all all the kids songs and he's just like oh this ain't (laughs) nothing wrong with the music but it ain't me it's It's about authenticity and then uh and then his son engineered this comeback of like you know we're Mm. in this different time where people want alternative people are suddenly Mm. not here's my music period they're interested in the new and the different. And if they're interested in, you know, what is Nirvana doing different? What is, you know, Stone Temple Pilots doing different? Let's re-examine talking heads for people who didn't pay attention to them. And uh, right. well, not you, Tony, you're, you're alt too. 
Um, and so I yeah. think it, his his MTV Unplugged wasn't like just this sort of like it was a comeback and, and it was a, you know, backdoor pilot for swing and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. jazz and and Tin Pan Alley. But it was also a part of the sort of this new dawn of like, let's try lots of different things. Yeah. Yeah, you're making me think of something too. It's fascinating. Uh, he he was the winner of that of everything you're talking about because uh, you know uh, rest in peace, Tony. I think it kept going for so long. But do you, there was around yeah. that time. You're so right. There was this push for. I remember like Pat Boone released covers of Metallica songs, right? <laughs> like <laughs> Engelbert Humperdinck was on the uh, Beavis, Beavis and Butthead uh, soundtrack. It was just like, hey, the crooners, right? And yeah. and and it it, it was quickly became a thing that didn't necessarily work. Uh, and not that all these people, you know, I got nothing against Pat Boone, but uh, talented, but he wasn't Tony Bennett. It's like you didn't get what Tony was doing. Tony, it was his authenticity. He found yes. an, uh, an audience who w wanted the music that spoke to him, the music that mm -hmm. he was, you know, born to make from his perspective. And he did it until he died. He, yeah. You know, uh, the, the man loved to perform. I got to see him at Hollywood Bowl. And I believe he was celebrating like the the fiftieth year since he first performed there. And he was like, "And I'm going to be back for another 50. And like, yep. <laughs> uh, yep. He that man <laughs> loved to perform. Um, Sorry, I just I hadn't thought of it. Released in 1997, in a metal mood. No more Mister Nice Guy. Pat Boone covering <laughs> heavy metal songs. It's amazing. It's a little bit the opposite of what Tony Bennett was doing. <laughs> Tony Bennett was kind of like. I ain't doing that. His his albums yeah, right. that were out when when he did uh, uh, MTV Unplugged were a tribute to Fred Astaire and a tribute to Frank Sinatra. And if you're mm -hmm. all curious, those albums are also in in uh, the the realm of MTV Unplugged. They're not big orchestra with brass. They're like right. piano, bass, you know, uh, jazz, drums. Uh, it's phenomenal. If you want to check them out, Stepping Out and Perfectly Frank, they're two of the greatest Tony Bennett albums in my opinion. Yeah, I do want you to check out Pat Boone's cover of Paradise City on this album after uh, the show today and report oh, back. <laughs> I, I will, I'll be cranking it up loud, cranking it up loud. Hey. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, fascinating yeah. memory uh, lane there, Walk. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like uh, like so much we talk about, everything is dependent on one's perspective of age. So we're talking about our, yeah. the experiences we had. Um, I, man, I, I wasn't always a huge Alice in Chains fan. I do this weird thing sometimes where I get one album. I'm a big fan of the album Dirt, so I got to check out that right. Alice in Chains one, too. Do um, you have any hopes or dreams or desires for somebody you'd like to see do an, an MTV Unplug? Yeah, I'm scrolling along because it, it went for a while, more than you'd think, right? It, it went into... Um... To that well, tw 2023, they technically did one. Uh, and um, to Dude. Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga Go. did do one in 2021. Okay. Um, so I just want to make sure I have not just you know, someone will say they already did it, but like, yeah, th look, um, I, I'm just cl the, uh, garbage is a band I'd love to see mm. do it because I'd want them a chance to break it all down to how they wrote the songs, what they meant. Uh, Shirley Manson's got such great stories to tell, she's entertaining, anyways. That'd be a classic bigger band particularly from that era as they emerged on the scene in 94 like to to look back on their career i just had the chance to see them not too long ago uh, uh 30 30 years after i first wanted to see them and uh, just they're still powerful and the songs mean a lot and this and and i would love to see that uh in terms of classic bands but there's a lot of bands that you know hi i would love to see uh, so that people can get to the core of their music and, and fall in love with them as much as I, I have and just in, in, in the power of their music and their messages and stuff like that uh, would work for me as well. Um, but I'm, I'm literally scrolling through my, my iPod or my iPod, my iPhone. God, take, take, there, there's my age. Yeah, there's a lot of newer bands, but, you know, I, I'd love to see someone like Garbage. Mm, yeah, yeah. No, um, I got to look up that Tony Bennett and, and Lady Gaga one. Mm -hmm. Um, I am, I'm not the, uh, you know, super caught up with modern music. I don't know who, who has done one. Um, I would love to see Lady Gaga, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Lady Gaga, uh, you know, has a part of her concerts that are basically like she goes to piano and it is kind of <laughs> Lady Gaga right. unplugged in the middle of her big monster, right. uh, stadium tours. Um, I'm, I got Taylor Swift's Midnight's album. Uh, it's got, that's got mm -hmm. a great unplugged mood to it. Um, yeah. But uh, I'm going to be born and predictable and say, man, it would be great to see uh, Guns N' Roses uh, do it. Just talk about the contrast from the, the big and the loud. Especially uh, the, now, yeah. 
Yeah, the uh, the acoustic version of "You're Crazy" on GNR Lies is one of my favorite uh, songs of theirs. Mm. Um, been lucky to see them in concert many times. Uh, and uh, parts of Axel's uh, vocal range sounded great, and and uh, some of it sounded like that like, like that man had been is you know uh been on tour for for quite some time so mm -hmm. a little rest up and then i think uh i think they could still surprise people i uh, absolutely think so uh especially after seeing slash at the oscars they're ready to go let's do mm -hmm. this uh you know it'd be great john williams just on like a little casio keyboard or something just uh, just <laughs> whistling <laughs> just john williams whistles that would be absolutely amazing. I'm gonna. It's sitting right here because I was doing some music things. So we're gonna uh, wrap up with a really dumb demonstration. Uh, if you're up for it, Ken. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. My wife knows I've been having fun playing with our keyboard to make uh, music for uh, for horror films. So she got me this thing called a stylophone, which I had um, never known about. Do you know about I, stylophones, Ken? I do. I, uh, Sean Arnold from the band The Moon Agers uses one on some of our stuff in his oh, studio. Really? Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Listen to that. It's wonderful. <laughs> There's my unplug uh, concert right Scrimshaw unplugged. <laughs> Scrimshaw with stylophone. Yeah. Why is no one here for my stylophone That's, concert? Yeah, it's mesmerizing. Mesmerizing. Uh, yeah, love that. All right. Uh, any any uh, final thoughts before we wrap up this episode? No, fun questions from the deep of Qui-Gon and, and, and Anakin and the future of the Jedi and them to... Tony Bennett, Pat Boone, and MTV Unplugged. I love doing it. That's right. That's who I want to see do in Unplugged. Anakin. <laughs> yes. Work through your issues with music, Anakin. Come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Uh, all right. You want to let people know where they can find us? Absolutely. You know, Cy Snittles and the Max Rubin Band. They could have done a great Unplugged at one point, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Bring it down. Yes. Uh, we're for Center Pod. Thanks for listening uh, or watching. You can find us on Twitter and threads and Instagram at Force Center Pod. We're on Facebook at Force Center Podcast. And uh, don't forget, uh, you can uh, get merch, tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. Get the Speculate Responsibly t shirt. It's still there because a lot of people using that phrase, and I'm happy about that. But the shirt, the original shirt, is still there. Uh, also, patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us. Uh, my website is KenNapsock.com. I'm on a little bit of a hi hiatus right now, but if you want to uh, listen to some music and uh, all the things I love, I have my radio show, Pop Rock and Radio. All the episodes are there. You can link from my website. And uh, upcoming comedy show dates are there as well. You, sir, where can they find your music? And <laughs> and I do have some. I, after you uh, told me about it, John Munson's uh, wife had has been in a regular rotation. Oh, on, that's uh, Spotify. so great. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that well, yeah. Well, thanks for the thanks for the pitch. Yeah. I I, I tell people about um my comedy albums on Bandcamp. Ken has comedy albums on yeah. Bandcamp as well. So you can just go to yeah. bandcamp.com and search either of our names. But one of the albums I did, I did a comedy show called Flawfest. And then I asked a bunch of musician friends to write songs inspired by the comedy as just kind of an experiment because I, I love uh, the way comedy and in music uh, relate and one of the bits in the comedy show is about the fact that I'm tone deaf and can't sing even though I would love to sing um, yeah John Munson wrote this fabulous song uh, called Wife Head and just like all the songs are good but it's just like you you wrote like the perfect 1993 mm -hmm. the, I'm frozen mm -hmm. and that's what rock should sound like to me song yeah. John it's Munson great. it's great. great absolutely great uh, so check that out check out Flawfest on bandcamp.com if you want to find me on social media, uh, my handle is my name everywhere. Blue Sky, Threads, Mastodon, Instagram. Come find me and let me know your favorite episode of MTV Unplugged can as well. For now, we have Aid the Cube.